An environmental ethic is the group of beliefs and practices that define how we view around us. It's a set of moral principles and values. So my question for you is, what is your environmental ethic? Well, today in Climate Change Science and Solutions, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. <music> general categories that environmental ethics are often grouped into. Anthropocentrism puts humans at, at the center. The main priority is ensuring the well-being of humankind. Physiocentrism focuses on the living and non-living portions of the system, including humankind, but uh, uh, broader. Theocentrism is very concerned in what does God want or what does a higher power want. So certain teachings, including um, specific religious or cultural teachings, uh, are very important. One common environmental ethic is environmental sustainability. This is ways of living that do not degrade the capacity of other individuals to flourish, and there are two important aspects of this. First, intragenerational equity. So for the people currently alive, um, are we living in a system that, that makes it possible for others to enjoy what is possible for you. And then intergenerational equity is looking into the future, meeting the needs of the present without harming future generations. So environmental sustainability is going to emphasize practices uh, that do not deplete or pollute the environment. So things like renewable energy, efficient transportation, circular waste management. Uh, it's not creating toxic uh, byproducts and preservation of ecosystem services, uh, such as climate. Nobel Prize winner Wangari Maathai described her environmental ethic this way. And as we look at this, I invite you to think about how does this map on those three general categories of environmental ethics. She says, today we are faced with a challenge that calls for a shift in our thinking so that humanity stops threatening its life support system we are called to assist the earth to heal her wounds and in the process, heal our own. Indeed, to embrace the whole of creation in all its diversity, beauty, and wonder. Recognizing that sustainable development, democracy, and peace are indivisible is an idea whose time has come. Really powerful call and very clear. You could organize this in many different ways, but for me, this really touches on anthropocentrism recognizing the importance of dealing with issues of social injustice and governance, and physiocentrism, healing the earth, both as a way of healing our own wounds and uh, taking care of, of, uh, of, of what we're stewards. Now that brings me to a second common environmental ethic called environmental stewardship. And if you believe that human beings are accountable to someone or something beyond ourselves, this idea might be interesting to you. It's very complementary to environmental sustainability. Now the details vary depending on the religion or belief system, but generally environmental stewardship involves living in ways that are in line with the Creator's purpose for their creation, including humanity. It includes, in addition to environmental sustainability, personal accountability to our Creator for how we interact with creation. So it's not only the outcome of that interaction or relationship, but it's the why. What do we view our responsibility as? And whether or not we succeed in creating a sustainable um, system in a particular instance, there is that personal responsibility. It includes beliefs and attitudes, often of reverence, gratitude, humility, and charity. So things that are internal to the human experience um, are... But this is getting religious, and I thought that you couldn't believe in God and care about the environment. At least that's a very common narrative that we hear, that these two things are in con conflict with each other. Well, in fact, I do not believe that's the case, and there's a lot of evidence to show. Um, this uh, study from last year found that countries with less religious affiliation 
consumed more per capita and emitted more greenhouse gases. Indeed, when you look at a global scale, the countries and areas that are less religious, the United States, Europe, and China, are the drivers of uh, climate change. Now, again, this isn't uh, <laughs> not trying to be snarky, this war of uh, religion and environment. Uh, I don't think that anything could be farther from the case. I'm just trying to challenge those of us who sometimes fall into these uh, very simple um, scenarios and beliefs to, to think again. A study from a few years ago uh, done by the Pew Research Center found that uh, most members of all religious communities that they, that they queried supported protecting the environment. The question here was, do you support tougher environmental laws and regulations? The first thing that I draw your attention to is 81% of people in the United States are in favor of actively protecting the environment. This is very different than what we hear sometimes. It's also very different from what many politicians believe. So I encourage all of you to reach out to your local or federal politicians and express whatever your religious or ideological background that you want to protect the environment. However, it was interesting that in this survey, only 6% said that their religious beliefs were the biggest influence on what they think about environmental regulation. So all of these groups have a super majority in um, supporting the, the in protecting the environment, but most of them aren't saying that, the that their religious beliefs are the reason why. Now, I hope that we can change that for those of us who do have um, religious or spiritual beliefs. Now, maybe we can convince you with a f uh, one patriarch and two popes. So Patriarch Bartholomew, the leader of the Eastern Orthodox Church, says, our duty is to accept the world as a sacrament of communion, as a way of sharing with God and our neighbors on a global scale. It is our humble conviction that the divine and the human meet in the slightest detail, in the seamless garment of God's creation, in the last speck of dust of our planet. Well, I first of all find this very beautiful, but also an inspiring view that brings together care for our fellow humans, care for creation and honoring of God. Pope Paul VI said the most extraordinary scientific process, progress, the most astounding technical feats, and the most amazing economic growth, unless accompanied by authentic moral and social progress, will in the long run go against man. So again, pointing out it's not enough simply to progress with technology. We need to really be thinking about how this influences our relationship with the environment and with each other. And Pope Benedict wrote, the exploitation of creation begins where God is forgotten, where matter is henceforth only material for us, where we ourselves are the ultimate demand, where the whole is merely our property and we consume it for ourselves alone. The misuse of creation begins when we no longer recognize any higher instance than ourselves, when we see nothing else but ourselves. So that last quote in particular is pointing out that anthropocentrism can sometimes lead to neglect of, of creation, and we need to be looking at these things together. Now, environmental ethics certainly are not only constrained to the Christian world, and I want to uh, uh, bring up at least uh, one indigenous perspective. Robin Wall Kimmerer is a, a renowned plant ecologist and a member of the Potawatomi Indian tribe, um, a, a leader helping um, both native and immigrant peoples understand uh, the, the wisdom and, and knowledge of indigenous groups. Now it's important to remember humans have lived on earth for a long time and for at least the last 12,000 years there was a study that came out in PNAS last year. For at least the last 12,000 years they have directly affected 75 percent of the ecosystems on earth. So it is possible over long periods of time for humans to positively interact with the world around them. It's one of the lessons that Robin Wall Kimmerer has taught me. Let me, let me read her beautiful words here. Since we lacked, lack the gift of photosynthesis, we animals are destined by biology to be utterly dependent on the lives of others, the inherently generous, more than human persons with whom we share the planet. So this is drawing straight from uh, what we know of ecosystem ecology and primary production. We can't create our own food, uh, so we have to take the lives of others, uh, plants, to survive. If we understand the earth as just a collection of objects, then apples and the land that offers them fall outside our circle of moral consideration. 
We tell ourselves that we can use them however we please because their lives don't matter. But in a worldview that understands them as persons, their lives matter very much. Recognition of personhood does not mean that we don't consume, but that we are accountable for the lives that we take. When we speak of the living world as kin, we, are, we also are called to act in, a new, in new ways, so that when we take those lives, we must do it in such a way that brings honor to the life that is taken and honor to the ones receiving it radical recognition of other aspects of creation as co-equals, as, as persons. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer also teaches the law of the, the honorable harvest. This is a combination of values and practices that reflect an indigenous um, environmental ethic. I'll read through these and I invite you to reflect on how this contrasts with kind of the modern world of consumption focus on self, and how it could inform and change the way we run our economy, the way we think of our relationship with the environment and with God. Ask permission of the ones whose lives you seek. Abide by the answer. Never take the first, never take the last. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Take only what you need and leave some for others. Use everything that you take. Take only that which is given you. Share it as the earth has shared with you. Be grateful. Reciprocate the gift. Sustain the ones who sustain you, and the earth will last forever. I find these teachings incredibly powerful and clearly drawn from a deep ecological understanding, a deep cultural understanding that emerges again and again and again in ind indigenous cultures who have evolved and lived in the environment that they currently exist in. Now, I'm a member of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I wanted to speak some about our environmental teachings. Here's a picture of the Salt Lake Temple with my children in front. There are many deep and distinct environmental doctrines in our church. First of all, there's a unique view that the earth is at the center of the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is our term for um, our, the wishes and goals of our heavenly parents concerning the human family and all of creation. So we believe that the earth is the home of our physical bodies. Also that after we die, uh, the spirit world is here on earth. And then most dramatically, we believe that the earth will be the, the celestial kingdom, the dwelling place of our heavenly father, our heavenly mother, and all of, the spirit, all of their spirit children, human and non-human, who seek to uh, live with them. We believe that there's a common purpose for all life, human and non-human. That purpose is to experience joy, choice and eventually be resurrected or restored. We also believe that there's a divine purpose and even personality and identity of landscape and location. So again and again in uh, the scriptures of the restored gospel, we see special purposes, dedication, consecration of different areas. Um, so this is a deeply ecological idea, recognizing the importance of the non-living portions of the system. choices are spiritual. So there's not a list of um, commandments and ethical or, or moral laws and then other things. We believe that each choice that we make, whether it affects our body, the environment, that's a reflection of our relationship with God. And because we believe that our physical bodies, both human and non-human physical bodies, are so important to experiencing joy, everything matters. Finally, we have many uh, specific commandments, the word of wisdom, our health code, which I'll talk about, the law of consecration, this requirement to share all of the blessings and gifts that we have with uh, our fellow brothers and sisters. Also, direct commandments to be stewards of earthly blessings that can uh, improve our environmental uh, ethic. And then like many, many uh, religious traditions, we believe that creation the world around us testifies of God and teaches us about God's nature and our purpose. So, for example, here's a scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is a relatively modern scripture from the 19th century. The earth abideth the law of the celestial kingdom, for it filleth the measure of its creation and transgresseth not the law, wherefore it shall be sanctified. So this is such a beautiful idea of the earth as a model, 
We shouldn't be seeking to modify and improve and change or correct the earth. We should be looking to the earth in all of our decisions. So when we have questions such as, what should I eat? How should I move? How, how should I make? How should to creation? Here's a beautiful setting uh, of, uh, by Frank McIntyre of the scriptures in Job that I just want to read briefly. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? So again, a powerful scriptural basis for honoring and following the laws of creation. Uh, George Hanley, a notable um, scholar in our tradition, wrote, What is called for is a theology that is simultaneously earth and body-centered, but that is so within the context of a spiritual understanding of the reality of eternal life, a theology that Mormonism uniquely offers. And going back a little bit over 100 years, the earth is very good in and of itself and has abided a celestial law. Consequently, we should not despise it nor desire to leave it, but rather desire and strive to obey the same law that the earth abides. We are for the kingdom of God and are not going to the moon nor to any other planet pertaining to the solar system. This earth is the home he has prepared for us. So some of you might be smiling and smirking, ha, ah, we've already gone to the moon. But I think the point of this, uh, this talk by Brigham Young was that we should be focused on the earth system, this incredible um, gift and gem in what is unarguably a very hostile solar system. Now let's look more uh, deeply. This is a scripture from section 59 of the Doctrine and Covenants, given at a time when the saints, our word for the members of the church, were being driven from place to place. The Lord says, I consecrate unto them this land for a little season until I, the Lord, shall provide for them otherwise and command them to go hence. And the hour and the day is not given unto them. Wherefore, let them act upon this land as for years, and this shall turn unto them for their good. I, I want to step back. So this is really interesting. They didn't know if they were going to be in that particular location in Ohio for a number of weeks or for many years or for the whole millennium, thousands of years. But the Lord says, however long you're there, act as if it is four years. So take that long-term perspective. And this shall turn unto you for your All things which come of the earth in the season thereof are made for the benefit and the use of man, both to please the eye and to gladden the heart, yea, for food and for raiment, for taste and for smell, to strengthen the body and to enliven the soul. And it pleaseth God that he hath given all these things unto man, for unto this end were they made to be used, with judgment, not to excess, neither by extortion. And in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things, and obey not his commandments. So some clear anthropocentrism here, that everything is made for the benefit and use of man. But it's interesting that the very first thing mentioned is actually more about the aesthetic ex experience. Again, this focus on joy, there is the practical aspect of food and raiment that we need, but most of these verses are focused with the earth. And I also want to point out there are such important uh, constraints put on those interactions with judgment not to excess, neither by extortion. And if we think about the cause of current environmental crises, that is the cause. It's not the presence or even the number of humans, but our overconsumption, our lack of judgment, and the extortion of the earth, whether this is with animals, landscapes, resources, or the earth's great cycles. Now this is the um, word of wisdom, our health code that I mentioned before. Look at what this teaches us about the importance of our interactions with the earth. Every herb in the season thereof and every fruit in the season thereof, all these to be used with prudence and thanksgiving. Yea, flesh also of beasts and of the fowls of the air, I the Lord have ordained for the use of man with thanksgiving. Nevertheless, they are to be used sparingly. And it is pleasing unto me that they should not be used only in times of winter or of cold or famine. All grain is ordained for the use of man and of beasts 
to be the staff of life, not only for man, but for the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven and all wild animals that run or creep on the earth. And these, speaking of the animals that run or creep, hath God made for the use of man only in times of famine and excess of hunger. So really uh, interesting, and again, I find beautiful uh, ideas here that if we need, if we must, then we can use uh, the, the flesh of beasts. We can take the lives of other animals, but only when we must um, in times of famine and excess hunger. Were we all to follow this, let's think about it, the scale of the United States, this would transform greatly reduce our environmental footprint. So if, uh, if you compare the typical American diet to a plant-based diet is what's being described here, there's an 85% decrease in the resources needed to support that diet, the energy, the water, the nutrients. So we could feed nine people with the resources that we're currently using to feed and support one. So again, I find this extremely oriented and helpful as we think about how we should interact with the Earth system. Now I want to really conclude by emphasizing many of these environmental ethics put forward that environmental problems are social and spiritual problems. So Pope Francis wrote, how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature, justice, for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. Beautiful phrasing. Now let's go back um, a few decades. Barry Commoner, not a religious figure, but an important environmentalist in the 70s, wrote, when any environmental issue is pursued to its origins, it reveals an inescapable truth, that the root cause of the crisis is not to be found in how men interact with nature, but in how they interact with each other. That to solve the environmental crisis, we must solve the problems of poverty, racial injustice, and war. Finally, going back, hundreds of years. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine. And it is my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine. But it must needs be done in mine own way. And behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted, in that the rich are made low. Unanimous recognition here these teachings show us that we need to be thinking about the social environment, our interactions and views toward each other. That, that is the only way to arrive at a durable and lasting and re uh, reciprocal relationship with the Earth system. Now, for those of us here at BYU, Brigham Young University, I want to point out this talk, this really interesting talk made in the 1979 by John H. Groberg, a leader in our church, and the uh, the character in the film, The Other Side of Heaven, in case you saw that. Um, I won't go through all the details, but this whole talk is about pollution. And here at the end, he offers an invitation. He says, in my mind, BYU as a part of the church should become the pollution control center of the world, not only spiritually, but physically. I feel that this is important. We take the gospel to all the world in a spiritual way. We ought to do it in other ways. So this recognition that there's no distinction between our spiritual activities, our interior moral choices, and our exterior choices regarding the earth and our fellow brothers and sisters and non-human um, persons. Let's think about that invitation and see if we can um, see if we can fulfill it. For me, the guiding light, the most important teaching, comes from Christ Himself. And when Christ was asked, "What is most important to remember?" What's going to be on the test? He gave uh, just two commandments. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Encapsulates the entire gospel. So what is your environmental ethic? What is our environmental ethic as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as members of any community? I hope that it integrates all of these together. And for me, when I think of environmental stewardship, it has to look at humans. It has to look at the physical and biological environment. It has to have an eye toward God. So 
thank you for taking the time um, to speak with me, to watch this video. I uh, appreciate your attention, and I hope that you have a wonderful, blessed day, and that we can draw together instead of allowing politics and other divisions to Warming push us apart. Warming with her melting ground Fruitless hunting, swimming round and round Dissolution of your home of all you've loved and all that you've known and you are starving and we